everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are here um, thanks to Operation Hat Trick um, and their support of the cooking series for veterans. Um, we're here today with Chef Julia, who's going to help teach our veterans how to make egg roll in a bowl. So Julia, um, I'm going to hand it over to you. Um, I have you spotlighted here so uh, we can watch all the prep here and have our um, veterans follow along with you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you for those of you who are able to join on the Zoom. We're so excited. This is my first um, hybrid class, first of all. So it's very exciting in that sense, but also this is my first class since March 11th, 2020. So you, thank you for being here. Thank you for like taking the, 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 the leap back into in-person activities. We're really excited. Thank you for being safe and wearing your masks. Also, we're gonna all keep each other healthy and happy and make delicious food. But I'm a little giddy, I, I will admit. So I'm sorry if I'm like just a little overexcited. I'm so thrilled to have you in the kitchen. Um, it has been far too long. I've been standing uh, actually right where you are for the last two years looking at a camera alone in this room. So it's just nothing nothing quite as enjoyable as like sharing the experience of cooking, uh, whether that's in a fancy commercial kitchen or whether that's like in a tiny apartment, right? We all have, uh, I don't know, hopefully we can all spread that love of learning to cook and sharing food together. Uh, on Zoom and here, who has some experience with a knife? Anyone cook at home already? A little bit, a little bit. Uh, and I mean a chef's knife. Like obviously we might have some other kinds of experience, but uh, kitchen knives, I don't know what that is. Okay. Um, so we're gonna actually treat the lesson as if people don't know at all what they're doing, just so that we kind of walk through the basic principles of knife skills, but we're here to make an incredibly delicious, fairly easy, really affordable recipe that works for both uh, immediate uh, sense of satisfaction, but also meal. You can do a lot of this stuff in advance and then it lasts for like three to four days. So when you're looking at prepping out a bunch of different things for the week and you don't have a lot of time, which none of us have, then you can do a few items and just have things ready to go. So when you come home after a 16 hour day, which I know most of us do, it's like, oh, I don't want to cook, right? But I have these things that I can put together in the microwave and call it a day. So this recipe lends itself towards that, but it also just lends itself towards having a delicious lunch, which when we're all done here today, you'll be able to take it to go. So we're making something called an egg roll in a bowl. Um, these things are very popular these days. Um, I don't know if you've seen on TikTok, there's all kinds of like sushi in a bowl and we're going to do that in a different class. There's all different kinds of fun recipes in a bowl. Um, the USDA recommends, right, that we eat like a healthy plate. The my plate um, is based on our nutrition intake. We want a good amount of protein, a good amount of healthy carbs, and then a lot of fruits and vegetables. You don't have to eat it as a plate. That's kind of boring every single day, right? Mix all up into a bowl. Have a taco salad. Have a this kind of a salad. You're still getting the components of a healthy meal. So it makes for like an easy concept when it comes to making food. Um, I don't know about those here. If you prefer chicken or tofu. We've got a tofu and we've got some chicken. Okay, you don't have to use all of this, but if you do, then you'll have a bunch to take over, take left. So whenever we're working with recipes, whatever those recipes may be, even if it has two ingredients and one step, we want to read the recipe all the way through. Um, you can find halfway through that it says, let this rest for an hour in the fridge. That is an unpleasant surprise if you have already started cooking and you're like, oh, wait, I didn't count on that. <laughs> so you want to really read this through. Or maybe the pan that you need is in the dishwasher. Whatever it may be, get yourself set so that you're not scrambling. You notice that we have everything basically out. Uh, the cabbage, the onions, the carrots, it's all washed and ready in the bowls. We have soy sauce. We have vinegar. We have our oils and everything kind of on the table ready to go so that you're not going to the cabinet every single time you need to get something out of the cabinet. Uh, in cooking, we call it mise en place, which is everything in its place. 
Uh, it's a fancy French cooking term for just like get yourself set up before you start the process. I watched my dad cook. He's chopped the onion and then he starts cooking the onion because that's step one. But then he moves to step two and it's the bell pepper, but he hasn't even chopped the bell pepper yet. And then the onion is burning. I'm like, oh my God, it's chaos. <laughs> get yourself organized, right? So we're going to do all of our prep first. If we look at our list, we need to uh, dice up an onion. We need to mince up some garlic and we need to shred some cabbage and some carrots. And then I think lastly, we're gonna slice up some scallions. The rest of it is like measuring and we can do that as we go, but we wanna get all of our cutting done in advance. So those at home following along and those here, we're going to do our onion first. Uh, there should be plenty of onions and whatnot in the bowl. Now the recipe, because we're all awesome, we read it, it says in the very top, it makes enough for four people. So if you wanted, there is technically enough ingredients here for you to do that now that we have gone down some people. So you could take a whole bunch of leftovers to go, or you can split this recipe in half. Kind of up to you. We have the ingredients, so you're more than welcome to make it. It's just, it might not all fit into the pan all at once. So I'm gonna be doing a half batch, if that makes sense. Julia, we oh, have yeah. a quick okay. question. I love it, go ahead. Maggie, do you wanna ask your question? Hi, Julia, I was wondering, is this class actually in person or offered in person? Because my husband and I, we really wanna go in person because our, we live in a studio and it's super small. So like our kitchen is like, like super cramped and we thought it'd be really fun to go in person. So is it offered? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, yeah Maggie, next class, if you want to join us in person, we can arrange for that. All right. Oh yay. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'm so glad you asked. We're definitely oh, gonna yes, have I more would, of these. I would love in person. All right. Good. Okay. We've got some signups for our next round. This is perfect. Um, I forgot to mention some things that I like to do to set myself up for success when I'm cooking. I actually learned these in culinary school. I keep little cups uh, around like near me when I'm working. So this empty little cup is for all of my food trash and scraps and whatnot to go into as I'm shopping. And okay, wait, don't do it. Oh, you did it already. Okay. So I wanted to teach a trick about how to dice without chopping the root ends off. But if you guys are experienced in chopping onions a different way, then I want you to do it whatever way you're comfortable. But for those watching in the uh, overhead camera, I'm going to demonstrate what I think is sort of the most efficient way to dice an onion. And I'm sorry, I wasn't fast enough. We want to leave the root end attached. I think I caught you in time. So leaving that root end attached, I'm gonna cut the other end off just where the greens used to grow from. That is my garlic, not my trash. There we go. Uh, but I'm gonna leave the root end on. I'm gonna cut it in half so that I can remove the outer layer fairly easily. You guys can go ahead and cut it in half too. It'll still work with your root end cut off. Leaving the root end attached goes a really long way to keeping it all together. So I've got my two halves of onion root end still attached. You guys can see this, right? Yeah. So what I'm going to do is put the root end facing away from me. I'm just going to go along and slice into the grooves of the onion, but I'm not gonna slice all the way through the root end. I'm gonna leave that attached. So you see, I'm kind of stopping about maybe a quarter inch short before I slice all the way through. You can do that, just pretend you have a root end, lay it down flat. Here, it's hard for you guys to see this cutting board, isn't it? Can you see this a little better? Yes. Okay, so we're gonna cut through these grooves. There's little lines in the onion, just use the tip of the knife to kind of gently slice down through the grooves. And you're just trying to leave the root end holding it all together so that what you're left with is sort of like a blooming onion. It's just all split and open and sliced up, but still holding together with the root end. And then all you have to do is turn it sideways and slice down. And you've got nice diced onion every time. Nice. So, hi.
And then when you're left with just that little root end, that can go into the scrap pile. So a couple of little tips for knife safety and just like practical speed. You want to hold the knife. I think you guys are all doing a good job. Fairly close to the blade, you know, a nice firm grip on it. Your other hand, just do me a favor. We call it the kitchen claw. Keep that first knuckle bent back. You see how I can still hold my onion and like guide my cuts, but the likelihood of dropping my fingertips off has been greatly diminished, right? It's still possible, not promising anything, but it's much, much diminished. If you just kind of remember to bend that first knuckle under a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And then I'm seeing you guys doing this fairly well on your own, which is great. Once you are cutting, it's, it's uh, practical to leave the tip of the knife on the cutting board. Now for the onion, it doesn't work quite exactly that way. Oh, that's pretty. Oh. <laughs> I'll share the scrap thing. Grab an onion. I think there should be one more in that bowl. We're just dicing it. So if you feel experienced, yeah, you know what you're doing. So I like to go right, like just through those lines all the way around. Until we get that nice dice. And so once you're chopping things, leave the tip of the knife on the cutting board and you can just rock it up and down. It's a little bit safer and faster than trying to lift it and chop at it each time. And voila, you're just going for diced onion. Food scraps can all go in your little cups. Thank you, Mina. Awesome, you're caught right up. Okay. What other prep we need to do? We want to get our cabbage and carrot shredded and then slice our scallions. Oh, and you know what? Tofu folks, are you going to want to make yours with chicken or tofu? Okay. Yeah, I mean, they're both, they're both pretty easy to find in supermarkets these days. Um, it's just kind of what you prefer. Both Chef, have a really have, high content of protein. Yeah, go ahead. We don't have fresh chicken, but we have canned chicken. Will that work or will that be kind of gross? Um, it definitely won't be gross. What you need to do though is make sure you drain it, like squeeze out any excess liquid and then you're just going to leave it until the very end and mix it in last since it's already cooked. Mm, okay. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. With all of the seasonings and flavors that we're adding in, nothing's going to taste gross. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Okay, so here's a chicken for you too then. Um, I'm going to be dividing mine in half and not making the full batch because it makes a ton. And so just based on the pan size, maybe we can split one. Okay, cool. All right, so cabbage. But let's wait for everybody. Once you're done with the onion, we're going to just push it slightly to the side. We want to make sure that you have a lot of room on your cutting board though. So if it feels like the onion is going to make it hard for you to cut other things, then you want to put it into a separate container, which we have plenty of. We can pass around these cups if you think. But what we need to get into now is our cabbage. Everybody should have one little wedge. It's a quarter piece of cabbage. So it's already been washed. This is Napa cabbage. You could technically use Greek cabbage, purple cabbage, Savoy cabbage, even little bok choy cabbage would work fine. Since we're cooking it up, the main thing that you want to do any cabbage is shred it really thin. Uh, it can be kind of tough. It can be kind of bitter for some people. All cabbage is good for us. It's a cruciferous vegetable, got cancer fighting properties, grows in the winter. So it's like tough. It's just what I think about cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower cabbages. So let's, oh nice, you're chopping it nice and small. I love it. I'm going to pass around a few of these in case anybody does want to put their onions into a separate container. You're more than welcome. Here, we'll leave these down on the ends too in case people want. All right, so the cabbage, this is a real practice in that concept of kitchen claw. 
leaving the tip of the knife on the cutting board because we want to shred it super thin. So we're just going to start at the end, leave the tip of the knife down and use that as your pivot point to just rock up and down into very, as thin as you can. So if you leave the tip of the knife in one spot, and then, and then you just kind of push the cabbage underneath. Nice. Yeah, so when you get down to the super thick uh, ribs that we call them, you can just set that aside. Unless you shave it very finely thin, it's gonna be really tough to cook through. But it looks like you did perfect. Yours is gonna cook perfectly. Don't stress about that. Cause it's good to use the whole cabbage. It's all usable, it's all edible, it's all full of nutrition and vitamins and flavor. It just can be quite tough. So if you're using it for a salad, I don't recommend. Cause like it's raw. But since we're gonna cook it out, it's gonna be okay. All right. Yeah. This exact same concept. So whether you have a purple or a green cabbage, you just cut it in half and then finely shred it down until you get near the core, you've got coleslaw. And the thing is like, you can get all this stuff in bags at the supermarket, right? You can get coleslaw and cabbage pre-shredded, but you're paying like $5 a bag when this costs a dollar twenty nine or something, and then labor, right? Like if you get a mango right now, they're a dollar because they're in season and they're amazing. But if you get that tub of pre-cut mango, it's six dollars for someone else to cut your mango. So learning some knife skills and learning some basic fundamentals can go a really long way. You're doing great. It's tough. <laughs> no, no, you're doing great. Don't, all, first of all, growth mindset. You're going to get better. You're not bad at it. So you want to have a, a little bit of a firmer grip. You're left-handed? Okay. And then try to just sort of plant it in one spot. Use this hand to kind of push it under the knife as you bring it down in just a sort of slow fulcrum chop. And if it's kind of awkward in your hand, like turn your body so that you are comfortable. Like move, what they taught me in culinary school is don't put your body in an awkward position, move the food so that it works for you rather than you working hard for it. You got great, that's great. Okay, last thing, carrot. So honestly, everybody, when a recipe says grated carrot, you can buy grated carrot. But a carrot costs about 20 cents, like when you think about it in bulk. And most of us have a box grater, right? A cheese grater. This is all that we need to use for our grating of the carrots. Uh, you can do the big hole, you can do the little hole. It really doesn't matter. It, that's exactly what they do at the factory. When you buy pre-grated carrot, they've just done it for you. So. Uh, we don't have to peel the carrots. This is also a fun lesson, everybody. Uh, Mina, thank you, Mina, has already washed the carrots very well for us. So as long as you wash the outside of your edible vegetables, you don't have to peel them. Carrots don't technically have a peel. It's just the outside. And so it is a little tougher because it grows on the outside, but it's fully edible, fully full of fiber and nutrition and beta carotene and stuff that we don't want to throw into the trash. So the more that you just wash your carrots and veggies like that, you don't have to peel them. So we're just going to use our box grater and literally right on the side on the cheese grater, you just grate it until you get close to your hands. And we're just going to for about a half of a cup for the full batch, which means not that much for a small batch, maybe a quarter of a cup or a half a cup. Um, the more you become accustomed to cooking for yourself, the more uh, you can figure out, well, I really like carrots. I'm gonna put extra carrot in my egg roll bowl. That's okay. Do we have another question, Maggie? Oh yeah, we don't have a box grater at home. So is there something else we can use or just like chop it finely? 
Yeah, I, if you don't have any type of grater or a food processor or like a Parmesan cheese slicer or anything that you think, you know what, do you have a vegetable peeler? No, just, um, we just have like a knives. <laughs> potato. Okay, then you can use your knife. So the way that you would do that, and I'll demonstrate for anybody else, you want to cut the end off the carrot and then kind of cut it in half. You want to square it off. So I'm going to cut the long thing in half. And that's sort of a challenge when something is round, right? So you use your kitchen claw, get the tip of the knife in so that the tip of the knife meets the cutting board and it's nice, firmly planted. Then you chop down through like a guillotine. Okay, then I'm going to chop that in half again and in half again. So I've just got these kind of long sticks. Then I'm gonna go across and just cut it as thinly as I possibly can. I'm just looking at you on the screen to make sure you can see, but just then, yeah, like an angle straight at it, like murder the carrot, which is weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like really, right, right, right. I love your sound effect. So you see how I'm just slicing the carrots extremely thinly across the short stalk. That's gonna work just as well, you guys. We just want it sliced kind of thin so that when it mixes in with the cabbage, it's not like big chunky pieces of carrot. So however you guys do that, if you have a shredder or you just slice it or a mandolin and then slice it, there's all kinds of ways. We're just trying to slice it kind of small so that it mixes in with the cabbage. And we've got lots of beautiful color and lots of beautiful flavor. That's all right. All right, last but not least, we're gonna slice our scallions. That's, I think you got plenty of carrot. No, you're doing great. But I think we for the quarter batch, we only need like a quarter of a cup. So that's perfect. Okay, scallions. It's like two or three per person. I think there's some in the bowl here. I only need two. There's a couple extra. There's some extra. You guys are good. We've got regular onion going into this recipe and scallions are green onions. So we're like, why are we doing onions again? They taste different. They taste very different. One is kind of bright and refreshing and springy and one is like more acidic, like a real onion and they lend themselves differently. We're also gonna use the darker green part. We're gonna save some of it as a garnish so that we can make our food beautiful and Instagrammable. So we're gonna slice through just like we did with the cabbage. Try to keep the scallions just in a bunch, slice across very thinly. So leave the tip of the knife on the cutting board. You're doing great with the lift. So see how I'm kind of like the knife like rocks a little bit, a little down and forward, down and forward. And then you get, oh, perfect. You see, it's a little bit fluid and then you can get that chopping motion down and it goes eventually faster and faster. I don't want anyone out there to feel like uh, knife skills like it takes practice, right? I spent $50,000 to learn how to do this. <laughs> a ridiculous amount of money to go to culinary school. But these skills were very well worth the price because I came out of it like two years ahead of had I just started out uh, at the bottom rung of the ladder. But that was like the choice that I made to move my career along. When it comes to your knife skills, all it is is practice. It's just repetition. So do it safely, do it slowly, and then build up your skills to the point where you're like our master chef over here, banging it out. I wanna point something out to those at home and those here because I'm a nerd and I love this. These will regrow. All you have to have is a little nub and the roots. The roots, put them in water and they will regrow you fresh scallions from that little nub. It's amazing. They will just keep regrowing in perpetuity. As long as you just keep the roots trimmed, you can then plant them in the ground. You can put them in a pot on your windowsill. You can have a whole green onion garden. Just buy one bunch from the store and then never buy another bunch again. <laughs> it saves money. It adds greenery to your life. And it's just sort of a nice way to replenish. We, we can you get like two bunches out of one bunch for the price and for the value. So I just, I'm a nerd for that kind of science. It regrows itself on its own. So 
fun stuff. If you wanted to start a scallion garden at home, there you go. I think in terms of chopping, we are ready to go, right? The only other thing that I wanna say for prep, and this applies to you, is you want to press out your tofu. So if anybody at home is using tofu, Mina, could you grab two plates, please? And then one large clean towel from under the cabinet. Uh, if anybody at home wants to learn how to make tofu or uh, is interested in making tofu for this recipe, very careful because it has so much extra water in it. It's going to pop out and spill all over the place when you do that. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to drain some of the water so it doesn't flood all over your workstation. And then you can open it. And what we're going to do, thank you so much, Mina. So this is a funny thing, but this concept is really helpful. You can actually buy something called a tofu press from the store. Why are we gonna spend $39.99 when we have plates and towels at home? Uh, all you have to do, get one clean plate. Here, let's do, not do this in my pan. I got this, thank you so much. That's okay. <laughs> I love it. Clean plate. I don't know if they, yeah, they can see this. Clean towel or paper towels, it's up to you. Tofu. Wrap it up in the clean towel. <clears throat> Put another plate on top of it, like a very strange plate tofu sandwich. And we're gonna put something very heavy on top of that. So I'm using a nice flat skillet because it helps to, uh, it helps gravity, right? To press down on the tofu. But what's going to happen is any of the excess water that's in this tofu is going to then be squeezed out into the towel. And for a lot of people out there that don't like the texture of tofu, cause it's like mealy or crumbly or whatever, this goes a long way to changing that texture once it's cooked. Uh, it presses out a lot of the kind of sliminess because the excess water has absorbed into the towel. So you do this for 10 minutes, you do this for an hour. It will help either way. All right, so if you're ever working with tofu, try to remember to make yourself a funny tofu plate sandwich and just set it aside while you get a couple other things done. And then like it's ready to go, it will make a huge difference in the final outcome of your dish. Yeah, especially if you're working with medium or soft tofu. But that's why I recommend buying the extra firm tofu for any type of situation like this. I pretty much only use soft or silken tofu if I'm going to be creaming it, like making a sauce out of it or making a vegan cheese out of it. You want it to be super soft or like a breakfast scramble, like a tofu scramble. That's nice soft tofu. Otherwise, firm is pretty much the way to go. But even, even still, it's got so much extra water. You're going to see just after a few minutes of doing this that the towel is drenched, completely soaked through, which is amazing how much water can come out of this soybean curd, which is all it is. But it's so good for us. It's full of protein. Uh, that can go into here. I'll take it. Thank you. We try really hard at the kitchen. We have very little trash. It's mostly just the plastic wrap and a couple of pieces from the store. But everything that we do here is compost or recycling. We're trying to be a 100% zero waste kitchen. We're getting there, but it's mostly the plastic wrap. Kind of no way around that. How's everybody at home? Everybody got their prep ready, kind of getting ready. Do we have any tofu users at home? I don't think so. Yes, okay, Maggie's house, excellent. So I hope that you are pressing in some way or another your tofu so that you can squeeze out some of that good water. Um, I'm just gonna set this right here for literally two minutes while we get our stuff set up because that's all it's gonna take. Uh, okay. So looking at our recipe and double checking everything, we want to be heating a skillet and then adding in our chicken and cooking it until it is no longer pink. Then we're gonna be adding in our onions, some of our sesame oil, rice wine vinegar, cooking that, and then adding in basically the rest of the stuff until it wilts. So just so you kind of know what you're gonna be grabbing once we start cooking, because whenever we're doing things like this, like a stir fry or a quick saute, it's quick. Once you get that pan hot and you start adding food into it, it's like, 
oh, I got to really be ready to cook. I don't want to be distracted by something or like missing something or fumbling like, oh, I didn't get my measuring spoons out because then you got to turn the heat off. Then you got to start over. It kind of disrupts things. You want to be ready to go like they are on TV. Like, oh, I have this and oh, I have this because they had four people getting it ready for them. Question? Yeah, we do. I'm so glad you noticed that. We didn't mince our garlic. Thank you so much. Okay, so while the tofu is pressing, we can do our last thing. You get a gold star. You get a gold star. Because this is an important skill. I want everybody to learn how to mince garlic. Uh, so uh, I'm going to be using two cloves of garlic because I'm a garlic monster. Uh, not like the hide under your bed kind, but the I love garlic so much, like the cookie monster. So I'm going to use two whole cloves. Whenever a recipe says one clove of garlic, I highly recommend bumping that up if you like garlic. Uh, if you don't like garlic, you can always just omit it. There's a lot of ways that you can mince garlic. Um, a lot of people have a garlic press. I'm not partial to a garlic press because it does not it does one job and it doesn't even do it very well. Uh, you usually have to take some of the garlic back out and then repress it. I'm like, you have one task. I don't recommend ever buying something through your kitchen that does one thing and one thing only because you can find something that does it and does other things like your knife. It minces garlic and does a million other things or a microplane, which we have over here. A microplane is a fine zester used for like citrus zest or other types of things. Can also be used to grate garlic. You can just rub the garlic and you get a nice fine paste. So having something like this in your kitchen, it does multiple jobs as opposed to the garlic press, which doesn't even do its one job. Uh, can you tell I don't like garlic presses? Yeah. <laughs> Um, but we have a knife. So we're going to teach us how to mince the garlic today. And if you are struggling to peel the garlic, the best way is to put your knife flat on the garlic and squish it. That should get the peel to come off like a little jacket. Just pops right off. And then to mince. Uh, it's not rocket science. First, you want to start rough chopping. Get it into some smaller pieces. You want to bring those smaller pieces into a little pile. And then this is the mincing method, which was my band name of the day, every day in culinary school. I always wanted to start a band named the mincing method. I don't know why. Uh, get your little garlic into a little pile. Plant your knife at about mm, 10 o'clock. And then you just keep your hand on top of the knife for stability to keep the pivot point in place. And then you just rock your knife up and down in very short chopping burst motion from six o'clock back up to three o'clock, down to six o'clock, back up to three o'clock. And then every once in a while, you bring your garlic back into a pile in the middle, plant the knife, and then just rotate up and down, back and forth through the little pile in short, quick chopping motion. Why we keep our hand up here? twofold keeps the the point of the knife kind of down so it pivots in the same spot also then we know where our fingertips are we can see them right there preferably not being chopped off all right once you've got your garlic kind of finely chopped down that is it and good to go thank you so much for catching that we would have a very sad little garlic list dish if we didn't and we definitely want garlic. They have been prescribing garlic as medicine for thousands of years. What is his name? Uh, Hippocrates, the one that the doctors like swear their oath to, prescribed garlic as medicine. So like we've known about garlic and its benefits for a very long time. Yeah, you bring it, right? Blood pressure. They think maybe even some cancer, all kinds of stuff. I love it. Vampires, of course. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. I think that that's it for prep. Excellent catch. We are going to make sure that we have all of our sauce. So like when it comes time to cook, you're going to need to grab some sesame oil, some rice vinegar, and some ground ginger. There's those things should be fairly nearby for all of us to be able to pull from. I think there's one thing of little ground ginger down there, and then you guys can share with me here. 
like every girl with a dress pockets i know we get very excited yeah you have to keep your oh boy of all the things the number of things. I know my seven-year-old niece came up to me once like, Auntie, I don't have anywhere to put my rocks. I was like, that's it. That is the best argument in favor of pockets I've ever heard. You got to put your rocks somewhere. <laughs> I love that. So cute. Okay. So that was probably even enough press for the tofu just for now. What we're going to do. Yeah, perfect is take a look at that towel and see how much water has squeezed out. Even just a little bit goes a long way, but you can see it's already fairly drenched through. Oh my gosh, yeah. Look at that. Very, very, and it's like a much firmer, flatter tofu. So you can see, I don't know if you can see in this camera, like how wet that towel got just from 10 minutes, the variation in the color, you can see the wet compared to the dry. So just a little bit can go a long way. If you do have an hour, then go ahead and press it for an hour. It makes a big difference. You don't need to cook yours as early as we do because the chicken needs to make sure it cooks all the way through. Um, so just, I will tell you when to get started if that's cool. Everybody on your induction burner, this is a uh, basically like an electric stovetop. And unfortunately, we're all going to have to learn how to cook on electric stovetops better now because they're going to be taking gas away from all new development in California, which is good for the environment and renewable resources. But I have opinions as a cook. Anyway, so you're gonna have to learn how to use electric tops for a lot of apartments and a lot of houses in California and, and a lot of places in the country. So it's good to learn how these work. This works basically by magnet. Like it will, if you lift up the pan and take it away, it'll start yelling at you. It wants the pan to be in contact with it. It knows when it's there. So you just leave the pan in contact with the stovetop. Yeah, it'll beep at you a little bit when you do that, but it's okay. So when you, everyone press your power button. On yours, it will say, what, 1200? That's something about electricity that I don't understand. Press the temp button where it says temp heat. Should say 220. Press down until you get to 190. That's basically about medium heat. For those at home, if you have a gas range or electric, you're just going for medium, right in the middle. We wanna let our pan get warm. This is technically called the ha-ha method. I actually paid money to learn that, ha-ha. Uh, it stands for heat, add, heat, add, ha-ha, heat, add, heat, add. We heat the pan before we add the oil. Then we heat the oil before we add the food. Heat the pan. So we're letting the pan get a little bit warm first. Then we're going to add in maybe just a teaspoon or so of the oil. Uh, this isn't even on the recipe. That's a typo. The line got removed. So for those of you at home, my apologies following along. If you have pan spray, canola oil, vegetable oil, any kind of light cooking oil, this, this entire direction got deleted from the recipe. That was my mistake. So the part where it says you're going to be adding in the chicken, we're going to first heat the pan, add some oil, then add in the chicken. So now that our pan is getting a little bit warm, you can add in about a teaspoon or so of oil. You can always add more oil, but you can't really, I mean, you can throw it away if you put too much in, you know, but we want just enough to cover the bottom of the pan. As long as you've got enough to really coat the bottom of the pan really well and just kind of spread that around, you're good to go. See all the beeping when you lift it up? Isn't it funny? It's like, <laughs> wait, where did my friend go? Yeah. <laughs> all right, now we're going to let that oil get warm. If we put our food immediately into the cold oil, it would just kind of get like steamy and sad. We want it to start cooking right away. So if you're making a chicken batch, actually, I don't know if you two want to split and then you'd have enough for two servings each, or if you want to make the full batch, you're more than welcome. You just need to think about how much space you have in the pan. 
because now once the pan is warm, we are going to add in our ground chicken. I'm going to use a glove to separate ours. If you want a glove, you can pass them out here so you can separate it. Just going to split this. Uh, you can smell it. It starts to look shimmery and it will spread out to the sides of the pan. It starts to get what we call wisps. When it starts to get those kind of wispy lines throughout, it's good to go. You can also, if you absolutely need to, take a single drop of water. And if it spits and splatters, you're, you're warm enough. And then you're gonna put your chicken in as a firm, solid brick, just right down on the pan. Don't crumble it up too much, just one solid brick. Once we have flipped and started to break up our chicken, you can start to go because uh, you're just basically trying to brown the tofu. Obviously it will cook all the way through. It's already kind of cooked all the way through, but depending on how firmly cooked or crumbled you want it, that means like how long you can cook it. Do you want it to be like really crispy and crumbly or do you want a little bit of the kind of tofu texture left over? Whatever, okay, so yeah, when we flip and start to break up, I would go ahead, so your pan is warm. Go ahead and put it in on one side. No, just go ahead and put it in. And then in the, uh, when it's time to flip it, you can honestly just use a spatula to like start to crumble it up and break it up. I kind of do because then you get a really good flavor, at least on one side because that flavor makes a really big difference in the overall flavor of your dish. Caramelizing tofu adds flavor and texture. And so the more solid of a surface area you have, the better caramelization you're gonna get. Um, maybe like three minutes on each side. Yeah. Well, I, then, then you can crumble it up after, but if you get a good sear on the side, then you're getting so much more of that browning flavor. If you crumble it up first, you don't have as much surface area to brown. Okay, chicken folks. The reason that I just put it in as like a solid brick was so that I can get really good browning on one side. What's happening is the aminos in the proteins are browning. It's called the Maillard reaction. You can impress your friends at Trivia Night. The Maillard reaction is named after a French guy named Maillard. And it's just the browning of aminos in protein. And so when you see your meat, that browning is the Maillard reaction and it develops the good, the natural flavor out of the meat itself. The more solid of a surface area you have, the more browning you get. That's why we didn't crumble it up yet. Now we wanna try to flip it over. We've got some really good, beautiful honey color and caramelization and yummy flavor. And you can let the other side sear and then uh, pretty soon we're gonna start to break it up and crumble it into more smaller pieces. I'm gonna give this to you so that you can actually get underneath that and flip it really well. Let's check the color underneath the tofu. Yeah, see how it's getting that kind of nice honey color? That's gonna give you more flavor than if you just did like little bits of tofu. Okay, so now that we've seared the other side of the chicken a little bit on that other side, you start to kind of break it up. So Maggie's house at home, um, the tofu, uh, we've got one person in here in class doing it with the tofu and she's done it the same way where you got the pan hot and then the oil hot and then she put the tofu in as a whole solid brick. Here, can I show them your pan? Here, Maggie, you can see here in my overhead camera, she did the tofu on one side and then flipped it over. So we got a lot of good browning and honey color on one side of the tofu and then flipped it over. And then after it browns a little bit more on the other side, then she's gonna start to crumble it up into pieces, okay? And then once it's all crumbled up and starts to get brown, then she'll spread it out and put the rest of the veggies in, just like we did with the chicken. Can you yeah, kind of see how she did that? Wanna see? Okay. Tofu. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, good. Okay. I wanted to just make sure you had a, like a visual, but you're doing exactly right. Okay. I'm so proud. Thank you so much. Yeah. 
Okay, so now you're breaking up the chicken. You can start to, once your other side gets that kind of nice golden color on it, you can start to break it up and crumble it up. If your chicken still has some pink in it, you just wanna make sure that you're cooking most of that out. So just break it up, crumble it up so the center gets cooked through. The chicken needs to be cooked all the way through for sure. We definitely do not wanna eat any raw undercooked chicken. So the next step on the recipe says to drain our pans, but we've got nice, lean, healthy ground chicken here. I don't know about you, but I don't have any like fat to drain off, right? It's really good, healthy, really good for us, good high protein content. So we don't need to drain. If you did use like ground beef or, or turkey, you might need to drain, which you can just do uh, through like a colander. Nice. So if you start to actually kind of break it up now, then some of the inside will get brown too as you cook. Yeah, exactly. I'm gonna take you up to 200. Since you're not doing meat, it'll give you a little bit more color. You guys are all doing so well, this is fantastic. Okay, so once you're pretty much done with your chicken, push it off to the sides of the pan. And I want you to see, I've got some stuff built up on the bottom of my pan, it's called the fond. If you have any stuff built up on your pan, that's great, leave it there. The fond in French cooking terms refers to the heart of the dish, literally the fond. Like we are very fond of the fond, its flavor, its, its love, its deliciousness. It's gonna uh, be lifted up off the pan when we add in the rest of the ingredients and it'll all kind of come together. Nice. And then as you go along, basically it'll just continue to brown. What I would then do is move on to this and you can just start to kind of like break it up into small crumblier pieces. And then as it mixes with everything else, it'll be, uh, it'll continue to crumble and cook. Okay, folks, here, I'm gonna move this. So our pans are still on. We've got some space in the center. We are adding in our onion and our sesame oil, I believe. Double checking. Yep, adding in our diced onion, our sesame oil, and our rice wine vinegar. So it's one tablespoon of sesame oil, one tablespoon of rice wine vinegar. And then mostly the onions. If you get a little bit of the cabbage because it got mixed together, that's all right. One tablespoon of sesame oil, which really goes a long way in terms of flavor and aroma. It's very strong. You don't need to go overboard. And then one tablespoon of rice wine vinegar. That liquid is gonna help to lift up the fond. Beautiful. It should, that should help to lift up all of that stuff that was stuck on the bottom of the pan. Oh my God, of course. Julia, we have a question about, do we have an approximate calorie count for this meal? Oh, um, I don't. Okay. You know what? I don't right now, but uh, I can get that to you because we have a nutrition app where I can enter in the recipe and then print out a label. We just haven't done that for this particular recipe yet. I'm sorry. Okay. Sounds good. But I can get that to you before the next class. And then I'll make sure that I run that data for the other recipes that we're doing so that I can answer that question for the other ones. Thank you. Yes. Stir that all together, your onions, your sesame oil, your rice wine vinegar, your ground chicken. If you still have any stuff sticking to the pan, that's okay. It's all gonna come up and to be part of the same delicious love fest. Ooh, it's starting to get really aromatic already, even with the mask on, it smells great in here. I love the ooze and the ahs. <laughs> Oh, I love the mouse. Oh, it's a fun. Is that a scorpion or a mouse? Uh, it's, a scorpion. it's cool. Yeah, my, uh, four or five, it's a nice. Nice. My niece is an artist. She is currently drawing me a, a piece. I commissioned a piece from her. She's an anime artist, so I'm very excited. 
I love kids drawing. So the style is so special. Anyone out there with kids, this is a great recipe and a great opportunity to get them to help too. I used to help my mom with the shredding of things like you can shred cabbage on the box grater, you can shred carrots on the box grater. Box graters are fairly safe for children to help with. So it's a great way to start kids in terms of helping with vegetables and helping prep meals. They get more excited about eating with you if they've put their hands on the food. Um, I started cooking when I was four very privileged to have had parents and grandparents who insisted that I was in the kitchen with them. So I think that it sets people off on a good path towards nutrition and loving food, right? Once the onions have kind of tenderized, we are going to add in the garlic, the ginger powder, the soy sauce, the hoisin, the cabbage, the carrots, basically everything else on our recipe is gonna go in. You're doing great. Exactly what you're doing kind of slowly breaking up the tofu while sauteing the onions. Exactly. All right, if you are at that point and your onions are nice and tender, you're going to go with your garlic. You're gonna go with your garlic, one teaspoon of ground ginger. Thank you, sir. That's all right. One teaspoon of the ground ginger. If you have fresh ginger, you could totally grate that in there, but a ground ginger is a great spice to keep in your pantry because it doesn't go bad for a very long time and it adds a ton of flavor, perfect. Oh, you could use the half teaspoon measure if it doesn't fit, or I know sometimes I just force it in, uh, but then you have a really hard time trying to take it out. Stir that in so that the ground spices can start to bloom. When you add dry spice to a warm pan and it starts to become fragrant, the term for that is called blooming. We are blooming our spices right now. Isn't that pretty? The French have a word for everything in cooking. Now we add the soy sauce. So everybody, and the hoisin, and the cabbage, and everything. Here's the hoisin. Yeah, you're just stirring everything in, and then continue stirring the whole time. Here's some soy sauce. Whenever we can, yeah, it's about two tablespoons for the half batch. One tablespoon of hoisin, my cabbage, my carrots. And I'm gonna put in most of my scallions, but remember when I said I wanted to keep some of the dark green parts of the scallions behind so that I have something to garnish my dish with. And then as you add in the liquid and the cabbage, it should start to wilt down. Yeah, the soy sauce is in a bottle or the big one, I'm sorry. Yes. So poison is sort of a fermented fruit sauce. I think that it might have plums in it, but I'm not 100% sure. We could look at the ingredients. It is nice. Um, a little bit sweet and a little bit tangy. So if your pan, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say just did a little Google for hoisin yeah. sauce. Fermented soybeans, five spice powder, garlic, red chili peppers and sugar. Fermented soybeans, five spice, chili, garlic, and sugar. That's yeah. hoisin. Yeah. Thank you, Emily. Awesome. Little Google search. So most of it's pretty good for us. If your pan is getting a little dry uh, or you have too much stuff stuck to the bottom, you can add in a little bit more vinegar or a little bit more soy sauce and that will help to kind of lift it all up off the bottom of the pan. 
And you're just continuing to stir on medium heat until everything is wilted and mixed together well. You see how it's starting to look like the inside of an egg roll? It's starting to smell like it a little bit too. Yeah. So when I make this kind of thing for myself as a meal prep option, I make the full recipe that, so it's enough for four. So then I have enough to maybe make one lunch as a bowl. The next day I'm gonna do uh, my lunch as a wrap. And then the next day I'm gonna do my lunch as a stir fry and put this on top of some noodles. But the basic, the hard work is done, right? I don't necessarily like eating the same thing every day. So I like to make it a little mix up, right? Put it on rice, don't put it on rice. Put it in a bowl, don't put it in a bowl. Uh, then I can kind of convince myself I'm eating something different. If you like eating the same thing every day, oh my God, do it. You know, eat the same thing every day, that's great. If that works for you, that works for you. Once your cabbage is wilted and everything is well mixed in, this is the one thing about cooking, you absolutely need to taste your food. So we have some spoons around the table, these um, disposable compostable sugar spoons. Take one spoon, very carefully, lift your mask down, taste your food, put your mask back on. Okay, we still want you to be able to taste your food, but we're gonna do this very COVID carefully, right? We're tasting. Now, this is how you can make it your own. If you want more of the hoisin kind of sweet flavor, a little bit more of that. If you want it to be a little bit more soy saucy, I personally want it to be spicy. Yeah. I want mine to be, yes. Hi. Our, Hi. our cooking is like a little bit. It's very liquidy. liquidy. It's like a soup. How do we like get rid of the, all the Do we liquid? turn a higher heat? Yeah, you can definitely turn the heat up. If it's just a little too liquidy and it's not absorbing into the cabbage or the veggies well, then you can also kind of pour some of it off. I think it's a tofu. Um, it was not like pressed long enough. Heard. No, that, that can happen. So if it's just a little bit watery, honestly, just rip the heat and that will help to evaporate some of it or just tilt some of it off, you know, like kind of hold your pan All and right. like tilt some of it off a little bit if you can, um, you. cause that will help it. But yeah, higher heat will definitely help. How's yours with the tofu? Is that kind of evaporating away? Yeah, yeah that looks like a good filling. All right, once your cabbage is wilted and your flavor is where you want it to be, you're done. I have what we call, this is called sambal olek. It's chili paste. It's just chilies and garlic. I like spicy food. So I'm adding like a teaspoon of this to mine. I'm gonna pass this down for anyone else who wants a little heat to their egg roll bowl. Uh, it's got a kick to it because it's just chili and garlic. Maybe if you put a, like one tiny spoonful and then taste it and see how you think. Julia, I think we have Maggie. Do you have a question? Another question? No, sorry, I forgot to lower my hand. Thank you. Okay, all good. If you guys are still having any issue with too much moisture, you could spoon off some of the food and then cook it off until it steams away. But hopefully, that higher heat is helping you to get it kind of more evaporated down. Thank you, Mina. Awesome job. I'll see you soon. Have a good class. All right, so a little bit of spicy if you wanna add spicy. This is how you can make it your own, right? I am not uh, in charge of how you like your food to taste. Luckily, you're cooking for yourself. You get to be in charge of that today. I don't eat cilantro if I can help it because it tastes like soap. Uh, I got the gene, right? It's a very, it's a, it's a, it does. Cause I love Mexican food. I love Indian food. I love Thai food. I have just become accustomed to my food tasting like soap, which is so sad. I can't even imagine how much I would like it if it didn't taste like soap. <laughs> Cause I still like it. But when I make it for myself, 
I choose not to add the soap, right? So when you're cooking for yourself, you can adjust all of those different things for the way that you want it to be. If your cabbage is wilted and the flavor is where you want it, you're done, turn it off. Yep, and it will kind of stay warm. So that's the issue with elect burners is you do kind of continue need to stir. You either need to continue stirring every once in a while so that it doesn't burn or you need to remove it from the surface. So what we're gonna be doing today you folks are going to be taking your food to go. Oh yeah, Mina counted them out. Thank you so much, Karen, I forgot. She's so good about everything. And folks who are joining us on Zoom, if you uh, wouldn't mind uh, taking a picture and emailing it to me, I would love to see the final product. Um, also, if you'd be willing to share on the Zoom and tilt your camera down, we'd love to see it. Yes. I would love to share them too. If anybody feels willing, share it on Instagram and we'll tag you on our on our account. We're at UCLA Teaching Kitchen. We'll make you famous. Just kidding. We have to somehow make it more like Instagrammable because it looks yeah. like, not pretty right now. <laughs> this is nice. I like this. Mm. Yeah. Does it taste good, Larry? You like the it taste of it? It tastes delicious. <laughs> well, that's all you. That's all you. So I, I have led you to water and you have taught yourself. So the thing is, like, when we do virtual workshops, it's all you. Pat yourself on the back because if it tastes good and you like it, then you did that. I'm really proud of you. Good job. All right. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to plate mine in a bowl just so that I can be a little fancy and show you how, how you could plate. Because I do encourage everybody when you're cooking for yourself at home, it takes a whopping 30 seconds, y'all, to treat yourself with the love and respect that you deserve. You don't have to go to fancy restaurants to have a nice plate, whether it's a paper plate or a plastic Dora the Explorer plate or a takeout plate. Take that extra 30 seconds, put your delicious bowl in a bowl or on a plate. We've got those scallions if you want. And then here, I've got the best thing. We can't have. We can't have egg roll without wonton, right? So we, these, they sell at the store and they were on sale. You look in the salad section. It was on super sale today, which made it an excellent buy. I bought extra for the pantry and it's just crispy wontons. So I'm gonna put some crispy wontons on top of my egg roll bowl, passing these down. Top that up with some of my delicious sliced scallions for color and beauty and flavor as well. And voila. <laughs> you guys are the best. Oh yeah, the sesame seeds. That's a good amount of flavor. We need to open this up, huh? Do you like spicy? It'll blend into the food pretty well, but you don't want to go overboard. Yeah. So I highly recommend that chili paste, you guys, if you like spicy food. So sriracha, right? Great flavor. The second ingredient is sugar. It's corn syrup. It's all sugar. Okay. This chili garlic. That's it. There's no added sugar to this. So when you're cooking and you want spice and you want like to add that kind of delicious love to your food, I, I beg of you, choose the sambal, not the sriracha. It goes a long way. Some of the choices that we made here today, we used reduced sodium soy sauce. We used really, really good healthy vegetables. We've got good fresh things like garlic. We've got our ginger, which is excellent for us. This dish is full of nutrition and flavor. And you can make it, if I weren't rambling on the whole time, you can make this in about 20 minutes, right? So you've got a lot of different things you can mix and match. You can add different veggies. You can put it in a wrap, put it on rice. So many options to having a delicious, well-rounded meal that is affordable, good for you and easy to make. Ta-da. No, you just leave all the dirty stuff. That's the fun about in-person workshops. I clean up for you. Yeah. 
just make sure that you've packed out as much of and all of the food that you want. If there are any leftover ingredients like that Napa and carrot cabbage, we'll just consolidate that all into one bowl. Leave the garlic. Uh, aprons can go in the blue hamper behind you if you feel ready. What? Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah, let's do it. Yeah, with aprons. If everybody on the Zoom, um, if everybody on the Zoom call and in person, if we could take a quick little, I'm gonna take a quick little screenshot with folks uh, maybe smiling or uh, just a participant picture, that would be yeah. great. If you don't feel comfortable being on camera or having your picture taken, that's totally fine too. No worries about that. Um, you guys, Emily wants to take a group shot with the people on Zoom too. So maybe if we gather, on this side so we can all be seen in the yeah. main camera and then we will be in our little zoom box and they will be in their little zoom boxes and we can all yeah. be in a picture together that does that work great. for y'all yeah that's good okay perfect emily hold on they're just packing out their food really quick okay let's see real quick actually you know julia i can see everybody if they just turn their head to the camera oh okay if you guys all that, if you can stay where you are. She's saying just turn your heads towards that Zoom if you want to hold yeah. up your food, if you want to be all cool and special. Oh, you guys at home. I'm so proud of you. I know. Amazing. Good job. Okay, ready? One, two. Oh, wait. Hold on. Sorry. One, two, three. Cheese. Cheese. Oh, I think she was still taking it, guys. Okay. Yeah. Let me do it one more time. Do Everybody another one, yeah. Or looking at the camera. Look at yeah, look at the zoom camera. I'll count out. Okay. Zoom camera ready. One, two, three. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, perfect. She said awesome. Thank you. Oh wow. Thank awesome. you again. Okay. Oh, Larry, thank you. Good job. Thanks for following along. And Maggie, everybody else at home, thank you guys so much for joining and for being engaged. And I really hope that you learned something and have some delicious food to eat after all of that. I'm excited oh. for the next one.